Oh, good for you. So very, very fun. Yeah, yeah. I call to order the October meeting of the Mission Fulfillment Committee. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Regent Davenport is traveling today, so she's asked me to step in and preside over our meeting today. And she's connected by Zoom and will participate as she is able. I'd like to rep uh, welcome our student representative, Sarah Davis, from the Twin Cities campus. And I believe we'll be joined by Brandon uh, Yang in Rochester at a later time here. Uh, thank you for being here. So now let's turn to our agenda. The first item on our agenda today is a discussion of progress toward Impact 25 enrollment goals at the Morris campus. Okay, I'm waiting. So. <laughs> Last fall, as part of our region onboarding, Regents Farnsworth, Hipsch, and I visited the Morris campus. Uh, the photo is here for your uh, to re see. <laughs> uh, dwarf, kind of all of us, but by um, this beautiful sculpture uh, uh, of uh, symbolic of indigenous people, and really this is grandmother water woman and uh, a beautiful story that goes with this. There are a few stones set in it with the pipestone from southwestern Minnesota as well. This uh, time to visit campus with the leadership, faculty, students, and staff was one of the greatest learning opportunities I've had during my time on this board. And I look forward to future visits to the system campuses and hope that we can expand those trips to include all regions, not just the new ones, as part of our continued and expanded opportunities for engagement. I want to welcome Interim Chancellor Janet Schrunk Erickson, who will join Provost Croson for the presentation. But first, I'd like to ask President Gable to provide any comments that she has. President Gable. Thank you, Vice Chair Johnson, members of the committee. So at the September meeting, as part of the board's priorities for this year, you heard from Chancellor Holt's clause about the University of Minnesota Crookston's enrollment management strategy with an emphasis on the impact 2025 goals. You also heard a review of peer comparisons and competitors, student demographic data, marketing and recruiting plans, and some deeper dive on how engagement with K-12 partners is working. Today, you'll hear from Acting Chancellor Janet Schrunk Erickson about the University of Minnesota Morris's similar efforts. And I'll just remind you that you'll be hearing from Rochester, Duluth, and Twin Cities at future meetings. Um, before I turn it over to Provost Croson and Chancellor Erickson, I want to take a moment to express my appreciation to everyone at Morris and across our system for their commitment to our shared work. And I particularly want to thank uh, Chancellor Erickson um, for her leadership um, in this interim role at very interesting times. So with that, <laughs> Madam Chair, I will turn it over to them. Okay, Provost Croson. Thank you, President Gable, Vice Chair Johnson, and members of the committee. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Interim Chancellor Shrunk Erickson uh, for the second in our series of enrollment presentations. As a reminder, in May, we'll be discussing tuition and pricing strategies for the board to consider including our current strategy and alternative strategies for pricing and aid, payment plans, and other features. Before then, each of these presentations will focus on enrollment activities based on our current tuition and pricing strategy. We'd therefore like to defer conversations about tuition and pricing strategy until the May meeting where we can explore alternative models. As a reminder, Impact 25 sets enrollment goals for each campus to meet by fall 2025. And the actions you'll hear in all of these presentations are uh, actions that each campus is taking to meet those goals. Our system-wide undergraduate enrollment picture is newly updated with the fall 22 numbers. As you can see, overall enrollment has been relatively flat over the past <clears throat> 10 years with changes year to year within a few percent up and down. The decreases in fall 2020 of 2.6% was of course due to the pandemic. And we're continuing to work on recovering from that dip in enrollment. 
The Morris campus numbers are in the orange section. You can see uh, the next two slides, which are split into new freshmen and transfer students, and again, extended to 2022 for when you saw these last. Uh, new freshman enrollment dropped in fall 2020, had a significant rebound last year, and is remaining stable in this academic year. As you saw in the recent enrollment memo, applications are up, and this small decline in entering students was an intentional pullback from a banner year last year. This slide, however, shows that the general and nationwide trend of declining transfer students is continuing on all of our campuses this year. For context, I'll repeat the regional numbers I shared last month. From 2011 to 2020, first-time students at the Minnesota State two-year schools has dropped by over 30%, and transfers into the Minnesota State four-year schools have dropped by over 22%. System-wide, our transfer enrollment has dropped 20% during this time. Although the kink in fall 2020 shows that transfer numbers were also affected by COVID, the decline in transfer students is sustained and is nationwide. Because that decline has differential impacts on our different campuses, we included a special section on transfer student strategies in last spring's system-wide enrollment report. So now with that system-wide context, I'll turn the presentation over to Interim Chancellor Shrunk Erickson, who will talk about enrollment at the Morris campus. Thank you, Provost Croson, Vice Chair Johnson, and members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss enrollment at the University of Minnesota Morris. Our recent challenges, the ways we are addressing those challenges, and the opportunities unfolding aligned with our strategic vision and plan. The work we are engaged in at UMN Morris is guided by Impact 2025's Commitment 1 to student success and woven into that Commitment 4 to community and belonging, as well as by the Morris campus strategic commitment to being a vibrant center for public liberal arts education that is engaged with the region, state, nation, and world, and that inspires and equips our graduates to connect their passions to meaningful futures. Our Impact 2025 enrollment goal, shared with you in the spring of 2019, followed a campus-wide forum and a report from ACRO Higher Education Enrollment Consultants, who, as they noted, engaged in a wide range of interviews and meetings with senior leadership, faculty leadership, student groups, faculty and staff with experience and investment in retention and student success. From this work and all of its related data analysis, we set an enrollment target of 1,700 students, which at the time was reasonable and reachable. As you can see, we have been at and well above that number in re in the, within the last decade. Our timeline for meeting this goal has, however, been extended by things unforeseen in spring 2019, the COVID pandemic being one of them, as well as changing attitudes toward higher education, shifting demographics, and a swift increase in competition for Minnesota students. As you can see, we are below that 1700 goal and below where we hope to be this year. The overall number though hides some good news. The incoming first year class this year and in fall 2021 were distinctly higher than they were in fall 2020 and we are headed in a good direction. We are building on that increase while also working to address COVID impacts on student persistence. Our current work is also countering a period of reduced marketing <clears throat> and visibility and of turnovers in marketing and admissions staff. We are also working to address the slightly higher melt rate we saw this year so that more students follow through on their interest in coming to UMN Morris. Like the other system campuses this fall, our new high school students persisted at rates below our expectations, particularly among historically underserved populations. We have already started making changes to address these areas, as I'll explain in a few minutes. While they are a historically small part of our enrollment, we are also working to expand our PSEO numbers. Other non-degree student numbers are partly constrained by local opportunities, and that's the gray line at the bottom. University of Minnesota Morris students are almost entirely full-time and on campus, and most are ages 18 to 22. Three out of every four are Minnesota residents, with about a third coming from the Twin Cities Metro this year and 9% from our immediate vicinity. 
Over the last five years, 30% of our students from our 30% of students, sorry, from our seven county West Central Minnesota region who attended the UMN system chose Morris. Another 28% chose Crookston and Duluth combined. Our regional pool is mighty but small. All of Traverse County, just to our west, graduated about 20 students in spring of 2020, and fewer than 40 in spring of 2021. Four adjacent counties each had fewer than 90 graduates within the entire county. We continue to attract strong students locally, and we need to grow our numbers across the state. Our longstanding attention to populations historically underserved in higher education continues. More than a third of Morris students will be the first generation of their family to graduate from college, and just under a third are Pell Grant eligible this year. Black, Asian American, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and Native American students are now 41% of students and comprised just 21% of our student body a decade ago. We are also restoring our strong international student numbers, over 10% of our students before the pandemic and an important part of our global intercultural learning environment. The University of Minnesota Morris offers a student-centered, rigorous and adaptable education in 34 majors with particular strengths in the sciences. Over 40% of our students enter Morris with sciences as a declared field of study. The Morris experience overall is a truly distinctive one with proven outcomes and not enough people know that. Like many other undergraduate baccalaureate arts and sciences campuses, the University of Minnesota Morris student experience is community centered. <laughs> Students who choose Morris and thrive there do so as participants and the impact of COVID-19 on our student life has been huge. Something really highlighted this fall. I've heard over and over again from faculty, staff, students, and visitors to campus how impressive the visible student energy is this year. So remarking on a change. Within Minnesota and adjacent states, however, the competition for high school graduates is fierce, especially outside of urban centers. College attendance among undergraduates has fallen almost 10% since COVID emerged in early 2020, according to National Student Clearinghouse Research Center data, a deeper than expected decline. And over the last decade, enrollment in our peer institutions in the Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges fell by an average of 21%, with some experiencing declines well beyond those we faced at Morris. The demographic shift to urban areas presents particular challenges for us too, including skepticism about the appeal of living in a small town. Our admissions staff, many of whom as Morris graduates, made the choice to live in our quite interesting, sometimes sleepy, and often dynamic small town where you can see the stars at night, <laughs> um, are well prepared to address and discuss the opportunities and the challenges of life in rural Minnesota. Still, as our percentage of students from racial and ethnic backgrounds underserved in higher education grows, we see with fresh eyes the challenges our students can face as part of a small, predominantly white community in an increasingly politicized and polarized national environment. I'm happy to note that Dr. Liz Thompson, formerly our Director of Equity, Diversity, and Intercultural Programs, began serving this week in a new role as Associate Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to add resources to our work. We know there are huge benefits to college life in Morris, and all who visit our campus in person get a feel for the warm and engaging UMN Morris campus culture. We are proud to be a University of Minnesota campus, to offer students a University of Minnesota degree and access to our system's tremendous opportunities. Our small scale can be, on any given day, both an asset and a challenge. We value, for instance, being included in system committees and work groups, and at the same time struggle sometimes to balance local responsibilities with system roles shared among a smaller number of staff and faculty. For instance, a single Morris leader often participates across multiple systems meetings, system meetings sorry, where the Twin Cities membership is far more dispersed. Our scale also means that the N is small in data pictures. A small change can look and feel big. 10 students taking time away from college due to COVID-19 
creates a 1% shift in our enrollment. The challenges are significant and at the same time energizing. I will talk today about the ways we are addressing these challenges and building on the opportunities around us in three overlapping areas, student recruitment, student retention, and marketing the UMN Morris student experience. Opportunities for improved recruiting are significant and not just because of the return this year to pre-COVID level, uh, pre level high school visits and college fairs and our threefold increase in visitors to the Morris campus this summer over last, although those are clearly important steps. We continue our collaborative recruiting with the University of Minnesota Crookston, which extends the reach of admissions counselors on both campuses. We have not yet seen a resulting uptick in numbers from the Dakotas from this as we had envisioned, but we're hopeful that as the pandemic ebbs, we will. A new Associate Director of Admissions joined us last spring to bolster admissions of, admission of students from diverse populations regionally as well as internationally. And we are renewing and revitalizing our longtime partnership with the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Our new parent and family portal provides increased outreach, support, and campus highlights for our students' biggest supporters. And our admissions implementation of Slate the university's preferred customer relations management system, has dramatically expanded opportunities for engaging prospective students and improved the turn turnaround time for admissions decisions. We are participating in two new college accessibility initiatives, the Minnesota Office of Higher Education's Direct Admissions Pilot Program, through which seniors from 40 Minnesota high schools receive direct admission to college and Greenlight Match, through which students are matched with their best fit campuses based on admissions criteria. Both of these programs reduce barriers to college application, and we are excited about the potential to connect with students who might not otherwise have found UMN Morris. A number of new initi initiatives supporting our Impact 2025 commitments to student success, community, and belonging are advancing student recruitment and persistence to degree. The first four items in this list on the slide are in order of students' experience of them. Morris Challenge, a philanthropically funded initiative, engages young people and teamwork to tackle challenges facing rural areas. This year's inaugural event was an immersive cross-curricular cross experience for high school teams, culminating in campus presentations to local leaders and campus experts of their solutions to global hunger. In November, the Morris Challenge Rural Youth Institute brings regional high school students to campus and showcases our sustain campus sustainability accomplishments in partnership with the city of Morris and Stevens County. This fall's new first year students are the second class to complete our new Morris 1101 first year experience course. This intentionally small discussion based course supports students transition to Morris by focusing on establishing strong campus connections, developing academic and college success strategies, and implementing health and well being practices in the context of undergraduate living and learning. This spring, we are piloting its companion course, Morris 1102, with a focus on academic planning and college to career pathways, as well as academic enrichment and engagement opportunities such as internships, study abroad, undergrad research, and leadership opportunities. Morris 1101 joins with our Intellectual Communities course as foundational first year student experiences within what we are calling the Morris Core. The Morris Core is our newly adopted revision of our general education program, thanks to a strongly favorable vote at campus assembly on September 27th. This is super recent. <laughs> the Morris Core is detailed in your docket. It meshes well with the Minnesota transfer curriculum, supporting transfer into the University of Minnesota Morris. It creatively lifts up distinctive strengths of a Morris education and ties our mission statement's emphasis on, ties to our mission statement's emphasis on human diversity and equity, global perspectives, ethical and civic responsibility, and sustainability and the environment. And it does so without adding more required credits for students. It aligns moreover with Impact 2025's Commitment 2.2 to increase the number of multidisciplinary courses. 
and it recognizes our longtime commitments to all students' engagement in transformative activities that complement and extend classroom learning, again, such as study abroad, internships, undergrad research, or organizational leadership. The Morris Core meets priority one in our campus strategic commitments, which states that we will build a simpler, more integrated set of general education requirements. We are excited to begin transitions to the Morris Core with full implementation planned for fall 2025. UMN Morris graduates are well prepared for graduate and professional schools, and we're working to extend pathways to those programs within the University of Minnesota. The pathway from Morris to the UMNTC School of Nursing, Masters of Nursing, and Doctor of Nursing Practice programs have been quite successful already. The Early Assurance Program between UMN Morris and the UMNTC College of Pharmacy, launched in fall 2022, gives high school seniors the opportunity to apply to both the UMN Morris BA program and the College of Pharmacy's Doctor of Pharmacy program at the same time. Work underway now includes development of a four plus one pathway from Morris to the Applied Economics Master's Program in CFANS. Our new transfer student services are part of our newly configured Student Success Center and our US Department of Education Native American Serving Non-Tribal Institutions Grant adds support for new partnerships with tribal colleges in Minnesota and builds pathways for their graduates to earn BA degrees at Morris. We're particularly excited about a teacher education pathway from Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College to Morris and a pending memorandum of understanding with our partners at Red Lake Nation College. It was great to have a group from, uh, of RN, RLNC students and their Vice President of Academic Affairs on our campus last Friday. The Morris Strategic Enrollment Council prioritizes and guides our collaborations to support student recruitment and persistence. Their current work centers on continuing to develop academic pathways for Morris students and monitoring and advancing our recruitment and persistence strategies. Two additional areas of student engagement and success to note include our newly refunded US Department of Education supported McNair Scholars Program, which increases low income first generation and underserved students engagement with and completion of doctoral programs and our part in the inaugural Howard Hughes Medical Institute Inclusive Excellence III Learning Community. With HHMI support, the Morris Faculty and Staff Learning Community Cluster is evaluating our STEM teaching effectiveness and inclusivity, including the content of introductory science courses. Students at UMN Morris have, abundant high, but have both abundant high quality learning and engagement opportunities and abundant access to those opportunities. Our task is to make sure more prospective and continuing students recognize and connect with these opportunities as part of a clear college to career pathway. All of this work rests on a clearly defined and communicated understanding of who we are and why the UMN Morris experience is an excellent option for students. To this end, we have spent time this past year working with an enrollment management firm on modern market positioning. Drawing on campus discussions, surveys of prospective students, and the broad experience of this firm, we are focusing on clear messaging to elevate our identity in high school students' vast sea of choices. We have determined that each of our 34 academic majors can be completed in a three-year sequence with some relatively minor changes in this year's catalog revisions, if that's what our highly debt and cost-conscious students want to do. Notably, of the first-year students who started at the Morris campus last fall, 63% of students had already acquired college credit through dual enrollment programs. On average, they entered with 21 earned college credits, more than a full 16 credit semester. For the smaller and smaller number of students who come in with no college credit, the three-year option will require summer school, but only about eight credits or two classes each year. While many students we have could already complete in three, but choose to stay for a fourth year, to stay for more of the Morris experience, we believe that the degree in three will be an attractive option for students and their families. The Morris experience is supported by three pillars, transformative student engagement, experiential learning, and sustainability. 
while our peers and regional competitors, such as Gustavus Adolphus, Concordia, and St. Olaf Colleges also emphasize transformative student engagement and experiential learning, they do so for a different student population and price than we do, and they do it without our strength and sustainability. At the University of Minnesota Morris, sustainability is built into daily life. From green living in the Green Prairie Community Residence Hall with its energy monitoring system, to abundant campus-wide composting, from our curriculum to our student organizations and community engagement opportunities, from our rating as one of the top 10 performers in the recently released 2022 AISHE Sustainable Campus Index, to our recognition for producing the most clean energy per student of any campus in the nation, the Morris experience is infused with sustainability. This, uh, this differentiation in the college market makes sense because it builds on what we already know we do well. In a reprise from a board presentation last year, so if you think you've seen this before, you have, um, uh, this slide captures some of the significant areas of student engagement at UMN Morris with comparisons to students at other universities nationally, including our Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges peers, and then about 1,000 universities overall, and our largely private and more well-resourced baccalaureate liberal arts college peers. What happens on the Morris campus is both good and useful to careers and lives. We know that, and we are working hard to help others know that. University of Minnesota system marketing has the potential to do us an enormous amount of good. Our reach is more limited than the University of Minnesota systems, and anything that elevates all five campuses can significantly elevate the visibility of the University of Minnesota Morris, especially when we can drive interested students and families to our new website and our new admissions materials. We expect to launch our updated website yet this calendar year. Design templates have been finalized, technical development is largely completed, and writing is underway. This new, more usable website will make the case for the Morris experience and its outcomes. We are grateful to be in partnership with the University of Minnesota Duluth for our marketing work. Lynn Williams, Chief Marketing and Public Relations Officer for the Duluth campus, is assisting us in a partial appointment this year, helping new staff settle into their roles and guiding projects and priorities in a fruitful collaboration. I'm grateful to Interim Chancellor David McMillan for allowing us this formal relationship, <laughs> which has been so valuable in our work to the up, on the updated campus website, our expanded social media presence, our new suite of admissions publications, and more, examples of which you can see here. And they're, all, they're also in your docket because they're really fun. <laughs> the Morris experience is, as we have long argued, similar to what Minnesota's excellent private liberal arts colleges offer, but at a public price. We are a very good deal. On the left, you can see where we stand in relation to some of our regional competitors. St. Thomas and Gustavus Adolphus are among the top destinations for students who are accepted at UMN Morris, but land elsewhere. When student aid is factored into the same group, UMN Morris stands out even more as an ex excellent financial choice. In comparing our pricing and average net price to our institutional competitors, you can see again that UMN Morris is a very good value. Several of our institutional peers are also public liberal arts colleges, Most each state may have one, and we are lower than all but one institution on total price and average net price. The University of Minnesota Morris is then an excellent value offering a distinctive educational experience as a baccalaureate arts and sciences university within the world-class University of Minnesota system. An assortment of publications and journals agree, and I want to call out just one of those. Money Magazine named UMN Morris as one of the 50 best liberal arts universities in the nation, and noted that Morris holds the distinction of having the lowest cost of attendance after grants of any institution in this top 50, as well as offering, they noted, a great return on investment. We deliver a top-notch education that prepares students well for lives of leadership and service, for graduate and professional school, and for the shifting landscape of work that they are entering, 
Most will hold multiple positions over their work life, including many with titles they've as yet never heard of and doing jobs that do not yet even exist. I am, and others are, genuinely optimistic and enthusiastically, enthusiastically so about the future of the remarkable Morris campus. We have a lot of supporters for the work we do and will do in the future. In addition to our highly successful 10-year capital campaign, which we concluded as one of the university's top achieving units over goal, last year was the second highest year for private giving in Morris campus history. This is even more remarkable since FY22 was the first year after the campaign's conclusion when private giving typically decreases sharply. As we continue our efforts to raise the profile and awareness of the outstanding opportunities at the University of Minnesota Morris, I am interested in your thoughts as members of communities across the state as well as members of this board about how we might ad better advance the visibility of the University of Minnesota Morris and its distinctive features. I will do my best, too, to answer any questions you might have about this presentation or our campus. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Chancellor Erickson. A great presentation. Uh, Regents, colleagues, let's turn to our discussion. Are there any questions? Regent Hip. Uh, thanks, uh, Acting Chair Johnson and uh, great uh, President Jason Chancellor. Uh, I went to Morris for a year and a half. I love the place. It's a great, it's a great college. Uh, and people that haven't been there should go there. You need to learn to sort garbage after eating lunch because it's <laughs> kind of a lesson, right? To remember that? Because <laughs> it's uh, totally sustainable. And I think that's a really great part of it. And I just want to just comment that, I, you know, coming from a small town and going to Morris was a big change for me. And it was really an a eye-opener in going to college. And I really appreciated having that stepping stone for as long as I was there, and I, I think we should push that. And I really liked your Pathways program and uh, applied economics, nursing, pharmacy, and so on. I think we should uh, even take it one step further and call it Preferred Pathways, <laughs> so that into all programs. And so, um, so if you if you meet the minimum requirements to get into vet school or med school or whatever, you can come out of our other campuses and make it more rigorous. And if you meet the criteria, you can you can start off at a smaller school and move into the main campus. So, and also, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the other pathway I'd like to talk about is a pathway to career. So, so if somebody is majoring in psychology, I'd love to see them have, a, have a, a license or licensure or something, or certificate in alcohol and counseling or something like that as well, so that they can go right into a career because there's a real big demand for that in, uh, in our real county. So thank you for your work and I appreciate all that you do. and. Uh, I don't really have a question, just more of a comment. So. Can, I, can I add one thing to that? Please. <laughs> Chair Johnson, thank you, um, Regent Hipsch. On the licensed alcohol, uh, pathways, um, our psychology faculty is working right now with faculty at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College to see if we can put together a licensed alcohol and drug counseling pathway where they would have all of the coursework completed and the 800 hour internship, <clears throat> which is one of the challenges right now, and be ready at the end of their degree, their uh, psychology degree from Morris to take the state licensing test. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Yes, thank you, um, Vice Chair Johnson, and thank you for the presentation. Um, three, four comments. One, I'd strongly echo the comments of Vice Chair Johnson about our visit um, that we took. I completely second what you said and thought, also thought that that was a really meaningful opportunity uh, as a new regent, and especially um, having had that experience and context when experiencing these presentations in the boardroom on the Twin Cities campus, I think is just that essential complementing experience. Um, second, to your uh, question, I think it may have been on the last slide or just posed in general about how um, we can increase visibility of Morris. Um, I you know, come from Fourth District, Twin Cities, grew up in the Twin Cities, went to high school in St. Paul. Um, and more just, um, I don't think I have anything super magical to say on this topic or a magic solution at this point, but it's something, um, the way you phrased it has now got me thinking and I'll continue to think after today. Um, from my perspective as a kid who went to high school in St. Paul somewhat recently, in kind of the inner city format about um, how we can um, increase the visibility of our U of M system-wide opportunities to particularly urban students. Um, obviously, you know, I was um, 
familiar with the Twin Cities opportunities or just more th as an urban high school student thinking of the U of M Twin Cities as the U of M option uh, because it was in my backyard and I grew up five minutes away from it. But um, intrigued about to learn more about um, from our admissions perspective or other departments, um, how we talk about the system to inner city students in particular. And it's certainly something just because it is my own experience and uh, my background, um, something that I wanna think more about in the context of the work we do here. Um, third, I really appreciated the information about marketing um, and some of those examples that you provided in the presentation, I think is, is Regent Hipsch often talks about and talks about with passion and probably better than I do, um, how important those investments are to this overall picture. It's one piece of the pie, of course, but um, it's great to hear that we have some collaboration and resource sharing from Duluth. So thanks to Interim Chancellor McMillan for that. Um, and that's exactly uh, how uh, we should be doing it with having those supports from the systems to support initiatives such as um, the Morris marketing efforts. And then fourth, I'll just finish by saying, um, understanding that we have the pricing strategy and that uh, part of the conversation coming up in May. Um, thank you for including at least those initial slides for us to start thinking about that and having that information um, before May. So thanks to the provost um, for that as well. Um, and I think though that wraps up my comments. Thanks. Any, uh, any other uh, Provost Carlson, any thoughts or yeah. about uh, kind of the question of um, what we can do potentially to highlight, you know, Morris for a place you, you wouldn't expect um, <laughs> students to come from? I would have to say um, with Regent Farnsworth, I grew up, I'm a fifth generation of Minnesota, I grew up in the Twin Cities, so Metro, but the four generations before we either immigrated to or were born in that area, more in West Central Minnesota, so I was aware of it from family and late place kind of things. But I think when you do grow up in the Metro area, you're just less likely to think about mm -hmm. uh, more, you know, greater Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And what additional things have you done or what can we do as a larger system here to put those kind of opportunities out before students who might be interested? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there's a whole set of things we are doing, right, around the, the joint marketing, yeah. around the uh, recruiting, you know, high school visits, all of those types of things. Um, I think the thing that's really unique about Morris is it's offering a very different educational experience than you would get at the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. And so it's a small liberal arts college rather than a big right. research R1 kind of college. And so I think thinking about how to identify the students for whom that is what they are interested in. Mm -hmm. Is the, is the real challenge. Sure. Farnsworth. I wasn't expecting this, so one quick follow-up, just when we think about that. So thank you, Vice Chair Johnson. I think particularly in St. Paul Public Schools, I know, I know there's a bigger emphasis on pathways. Now, I mean, even just walking into the high school I went to the other day, Regent Mayron and I went to, actually, um, <laughs> that um, they, you know, it's been an IB school for a long time, but now they're emphasizing career pathways, and that's happening in other high schools. And so i hearing a lot, us talk a lot about pathways mm -hmm. at Morris, which I think is great. And so um, perhaps, you know, a big urban school district such as St. Paul, mm -hmm. moving more in that direction of emphasizing career pathways. That provides some great um, opportunities for our admissions folks or other, you know, university strategy to plug right in and do exactly what you were just talking about, um, Provost. So, thank you, Regent Swigum. Um, Madam Chair, thank you, um, uh, Chancellor uh, Schrunk Erickson. I uh, I don't want to sound like a, a negative challenger, I, but but numbers speak for themselves. Yeah. So I, I want to get down to numbers, uh, if, if I can. The first being a bigger picture of the state of Minnesota. I'm just wondering your perspective on this, and then I ask, I'll ask a question about Morris in particular. Um, but you talk about the, uh, the market challenges we have. I think you said Traverse County had 24 graduates last year or mm -hmm. whatever. In the big picture, Chancellor, in the big picture of the state of Minnesota, as we look at our privates, our publics, Minnesota State University, of Minnesota, and the market we're trying to serve, are we as a state over uh, populized with the number of higher education institutions we have? Maybe. Um, uh, yes, you know, it, yes it really, or maybe. it really, de it depends. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the question, uh, Regent Spigum. It depends on. Um, 
I think, growth of certain institutions. And I, you know, if the Twin Cities does continue to grow its undergraduate population, it has a ripple effect. If Minsky changes its direction and closes some of its campuses, um, or uh, and it has, I, I think, more challenges even than we do, then I don't think we are um, particularly overserved. We are the only public option that, uh, for an education like this in the state. I think that the privates um, are seeing some growth, and I would like to steal some of their growth. I admit, <laughs> uh, but they are getting the students. We have to. We do have to reach out of state. Um, I think that um, we have a number of students. Um, our student regent is um, from South Dakota, <laughs> so we we do draw from the West as well. Um, so, in terms of Morris's future in particular, I don't think that we are duplicative or competing too much for the same number of students. Um, Madam Chancellor, I, uh, I, I, this is something we ought not talk about, obviously, because it sounds negative and it sounds, but if I was back in the legislature and I could be benevolent dictator and you know, we, we like access for our students. I think at one time in Minnesota, we wanted to have every, uh, a, a, a secondary college or institution within 50 miles of every student mm. in the state. Mm -hmm. I think that was a goal we had years yeah. ago. But when you look at our graduating populations and how it has gone down, you look at our market capabilities, um, and Minnesota State is having more difficulty than we are at the university. I mean, honestly, if we were sitting at the Minnesota State Board, we'd be even more concerned than we are now uh, sitting here. You know. Uh, we, we have very few problems, Provost, that 200 more students at uh, Crookston and 200 more students at Morris and, and 500 more at Duluth wouldn't take care of. Uh, but in the big, big picture, and I'm talking about the state of Minnesota, I don't want to get into a base closing type of uh, scenario that Congress did 20 years ago uh, because it destroys political careers and it destroys mm -hmm. persons' credibility. But I, but I would tell you, if I was that benevolent dictator, we probably wouldn't have as many campuses and institutions today in Minnesota as, as we do. Um, I, I, I do feel that for our population and our market, we are overpopulized with a number of post-secondary institutions. Uh, personal feeling I have, I was just wondering how you felt about that big picture. Uh, Regent Spigum, I have had that conversation in my head a lot, <laughs> um, and I, I continue again to think that the University of Minnesota is not overextended. I think um, without, I don't want to tell my Minsku colleagues what to do, obviously, um, but again, I think that if we lose a campus like Morris, and I will only speak for Morris, it's a major gap, and I would like at least to be able to see if the things that we are doing differently can turn it around. If not, obviously we continue to have that conversation in five years or 10 years and see where we land and see what happens. There are things inevitably that pop up that we didn't expect. I think had the pandemic not occurred and had it not hit the population we serve particularly hard, if you look at students from historically underrepresented populations and the impact of COVID on them, it is much more substantial than it is for more affluent um, and majority race students. I think we would have been in a much better enrollment position than we are now. Yeah, and, and Chancellor, I would not be saying that Morris is the one that we would be looking at. <laughs> obviously, okay. but, but a base closing, college closing, right. uh, university, it would destroy a lot of political careers and mm -hmm. we understand that. And that's why it'd be very, very difficult to do. And yet um, they are closing across the nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. I haven't, I don't know of any in Minnesota, but, no. uh, but, but there have been colleges that have closed. So, yes. um, and then my second question, and, and as thin ice as the first question that I was on, as thin ice, when we look at Morris in specific, and our population for next year is 1,024, mm -hmm. which is far off what we want to be in 2025. I mean, far off. Uh, I can't imagine being able to find 700 students yeah. in. We're not going to meet the 2025. We're, we're not going to meet the 1700. I don't think that's going to happen. As a campus, 
And as an institution of the university, we like to promote and we need to promote and it's important to promote DEI and diversity. Is it possible that at Morris we've become too diverse? Is it possible all from a marketing standpoint? For, for instance, Chancellor, I've received a couple letters, two actually, from friends whose uh, children are not going to go to Morris. Uh, because it is too diverse, let's say, a, 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 a campus. They just didn't feel comfortable there. Is that at all possible in the specific of Morris that we become too diverse uh, for, you know, for, for, a, for a student to attend? And again, I'm, I'm on thin ice. I understand that. I, mm -hmm. But sure. at 71 years or 72 years old, I say things that I would never even thought when I was 52. <laughs> but it gives you a little, a little freedom to do that. Vice Chair Johnson, Regent Svigum. Mm -hmm. um, I had a meeting this week with uh, students who are members of the Black Student Union on our campus. I think that they would be shocked that anyone would think our campus was too diverse. Um, uh, they certainly at times feel very isolated where they are located. So um, from that perspective, the answer is no. I would add to it that um, multiple perspectives are absolutely core to education and particularly liberal arts education. It's something that we highly value and we try really hard to be inclusive of all perspectives, not just those of historically underrepresented populations. That is not the, they are not yet the majority of students on our campus. And so, um, it would not feel comfortable that, that it would not feel comfortable because it's too diverse would surprise me. Um, I would note. Well, I could show you the letters. That I <laughs> yeah. Say. No, one was well, a phone call. To be very honest. One I, I might call. speak to the increasing polarization and politicization um, sure. as well as a factor in that perception, rather than the actual on the ground experience of the students and our student numbers. Good answer. Good answer. I'm the one on thin ice, not you. So uh, good answer, but. When I do look at uh, uh, the numbers, and again, just to the numbers, uh, when I see uh, uh, the number of race ethnicity being 41% BIPOC, that's probably a greater percentage than Minnesota as a general number, I would guess. I'd have to ask my data person. I, I, I would guess. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that for sure. Again, I'm guessing. But from at least some con two contacts I received, and, and again, thin ice, but I needed to say it, and I have the freedom to be able to do so. <laughs> Chair Johnson, Regent Svigum, one quick follow-up. I know the diversity of the population in rural Minnesota has dramatically changed over the last decade and increasingly is changing. So there are, it is a more and more diverse population, even in Stevens County. And we would very much like to capture some of the students who are there, who are coming from um, families who have immigrated um, from Central or South America, from Africa, from uh, places uh, who are finding themselves in the second generation now in Western Central Minnesota. Well, Chancellor, good answer. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, I want to help you in any way I can to get to that 1700 number. Thank you. Which is not going to happen by 2025. But not, maybe not by 2025, okay, well, but hold, maybe a few I years after that? that. Maybe not. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure. We, I, I really do not think we will make it by okay. 2025. <laughs> that's, but, better, that's better than maybe not. That's yeah. more direct. OK. Thank you, Regent. Regent Rocha. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Johnson. So um, before I go to my um, intended remarks, I just want to touch on, on the, the last dialogue. I think that. Um, you know, from a from a, st a student perspective, particularly somebody that comes from, you know, I would think from, uh, well, any community of color, at, at Morris, where you where you do have a a stronger percentage than you know, I mean, as as history goes, a, a, a growing strength in diversity or in the number of of students of color, the minute you step off campus, you, you are <laughs> back into a uh, very heavily um, um, uh, white community, and so I think that from that standpoint, it would, I, would, I would be quite surprised uh, that a student would have a legitimate concern about feeling somehow out of place. But even if they do, I can really think of no better experience than for them to be in a heavily diverse community to understand that 
uh, that 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 shouldn't matter and they should feel welcome and and so I'm I w I'm, I'm concerned for the people that are raising that 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 specific issue um, at, I would also say that as I understand it well while, while I think uh, the Morris campus student body reflects a greater diversity than if you looked at the state as a whole if you look at the graduating classes of high school students, um, particularly in the metropolitan area, I, it may actually be below um, the diversity of, of the students coming out of, the, out of the, the, the largest schools. And so this clearly is the future of our enrollment, um, not, not something that would be an anomaly at the current time. So I just want to make sure that, um, that you know, we're on track, that, that this is a, a good opportunity for students as opposed to something that we should, we should be harboring concern about. Um, Going back to the, the, the campus as a whole and, and Regent Sigum's earlier point, um, I, I think was, a, was a, a good one in talking about sort of where we are as a state. And we don't really have, you know, having been back on this board now for almost eight years in this iteration, um, we don't really have many conversations about where we fit within higher ed as a state. Um, Regents Figum, um, the base closings, I think, were almost 30 years ago. Um, I had a chance to, to watch that with a, a pretty good seat as a, as a member of the, of the Guard. But um, we also had some major changes in our state with the creation of Minnesota State. If you remember, we used to have a lot of community colleges and ABTIs right across the street from each other in a community. And, and you know, the efficiency, inefficiency challenges there, there were some consolidations and things and so on, but uh, there have been some pretty major changes. In it. And when you look at changes in the population as a whole, I think it is an important question for us to have. And you're absolutely right on. I mean, Minnesota State has got tremendous challenges. I think Morris is, quite frankly, blessed to have the Block M um, yes. uh, as a way of, of staying in there. And, and there are important, I think, um, ways that that can be used to, uh, to, to, to bolster the, the school. Um, I've mentioned before, of, of course, um, I think most of the people at this board now weren't uh, on the board, but you know, when I, when I left the board in 95, Morris was the crown jewel of the University of Minnesota system. Uh, it was the highest ACT uh, institution. You know, it, it was a very different Twin Cities campus. Um, I would actually propose that if you, you know, going back, the Twin Cities actually had more undergraduates um, coming out of the 80s and into the early 90s because of General College and University College had enormous numbers of students. Um, so we were um, the second largest campus in the nation behind Ohio State at the time. At least that's what we were told then. And, and, and uh, um, so the, the Twin Cities, I think, has changed quite a bit. But with Morris, um, when I actually went back to see, I, I was so surprised when I came back in 2015 that Morris was having these enrollment challenges. And um, when I looked ACT-wise, Morris had stayed the same. The difference was the Twin Cities had gone from a, you know, a lower score because of its enro enrollment or its admissions policies at the time had gone you know, substantially higher, and which I think then becomes a challenge for a small school because I think that sort of elite sense of Morris being the strongest academic campus uh, was a good marketing tool uh, back then, but that, that obviously isn't there anymore um, in the same way. If, if you if you take, I, I see it as slide 17 out of 71. I don't know if that's what everyone else is. But it's the one that shows the enrollment within the, the dotted line. Now, it's, if you put your hand over the dotted line, it, there's some reason to be really concerned. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I have, I, I agree with Regent Sviggum's point also that, you know, the tradition here around this table is to, is to thank you for the wonderful presentation, and we all feel really good about the positive things, but I got to tell you that you know, for um, you know, over three decades, I have sat at a board table and gotten reports on on the status of our campuses and on status of Morris. And I think that we have a reason to be concerned. Um, over the past eight years that I've been back on the board, we've had a very similar report. Um, and if you go back to 15, you can see every year we've had a continuing decline. You, we can we can apportion some of it perhaps to COVID, but at the same time, it's still part of a pretty consistent trend line. Um, and it makes me um, really concerned because I love the Morris campus. I love the presence in that part of the state. I think it's an important relationship that we have with that part of the state as the land grant university. Certainly it's an important legislative relationship to ensure that we have a presence in, in parts of the state where you need that kind of support to continue to get state funding. Um, I am a little bit concerned because as we talked about um, enrollment um, and recruitment, uh, dynamics, it was really guided from within. 
I, I think, from within the institution. And then the challenge with that is it's, it, you know, we're, we're all humans and when, when you go inside the institution to get the feedback on what we can do differently, it's going to, I think, pretty much reflect what we're already doing. And, and so I don't know that, I think at some point in time, we've got to take a real step back and say, well, what exactly are we doing with Morris? What is its mission? How is it meeting the university's mission? And how do we, how do we change this trend? Um, you know, massive shifts in the marketplace in demand. Mm -hmm. it's, it's stunning, you know, when, when, the, uh, when you consider that um, so much of our rural presence in higher education was created when the state was at, at worst 50-50 rural urban. Um, it's not even close to that anymore. You know, it's dramatically um, uh, metropolitanized. And, and so, you know, I, I look at Morris right now, and, I, and, and even with those tiny numbers of graduates from various counties, where are the regional students choosing to go? Um, I, I have a strong sense that they're likely heading west um, and because they're being recruited so heavily. And then the question is, what are they seeking? What, what is it that, that they're seeking for a, an undergraduate experience? Because right now, I, I feel like when, when I look at Morris, and I still think it's an exceptional school, uh, I would be very proud to have any of my children choose Morris. Um, but the programs are really geared toward what I see as a metropolitan student focus. The problem is metropolitan students are less and less likely to move outside of a populated area to go to college. And we're seeing that at all these beautiful, amazing liberal arts colleges. Um, you know, the St. Olaf's of the world are fortunate to be within a fairly close drive to the Twin Cities and in a kind of a collegiate cluster. Um, but, you know, I would just say that I think we have to have, we have to ask some really important questions about that. Because the, while, while we are exceptional in areas like sustainability and some of these programs, applied economics, those programs are also in some iteration available or some form available at other institutions where students are choosing to live for the community as much as anything. And so I guess, you know, I, I, I don't know if I will get an answer here, but we're moving into a, a, you know, we're doing a chancellor search right now. Well, the skill sets of that position, the skill sets that we're expecting from that position are going to be absolutely critical if you figure that that position, if we expect someone to be here for a decade, yeah, a decade at the current number means the campus would not remain. And so I'm, I'm interested from President Gable, you know, what, what do we see as the mission of the Morris campus? Why are we there? What are we planning to, to offer? What is the marketplace telling us, not in the next fall semester, but in the next 10 years? Because it, it, I believe that, again, unfortunately, I, I have this 30-year window of watching this develop. I think we need to ask those very difficult questions and, and get some really good answers. I think that the, I think that the footprint is amazing. I think the relationship um, with communities, particularly communities of color, uh, something that we absolutely should be building on. Um, but, but in terms of what we're offering and how we're going to, um, can, how we're going to sustain that as a physical presence for, for uh, college students in, in, in our system, I think we need to really have that, that dialogue. And, and I think, you know, I, I don't know how comfortable I feel even going through a chancellor search and, and selecting somebody until we know what we're expecting that individual to, de to deliver with respect to a campus that, that is clearly facing some, some challenges in a world that's changing around it while it continues to offer an amazing uh, education. So uh, not exactly a ray of sunshine over here, but at the same point, um, I love the campus enough to, 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 to bring up those questions and hope that we can move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any response, Acting Chancellor? Yes, please. Regent, um, Vice Chair Johnson, Regent Rocha, um, I, you've raised issues, of, again, that we certainly think about and have thought about. and. Um, I want to make just two quick points um, here now. One is that we have gotten outside help um, from agencies. Um, 3E Enrollment Marketing is a firm that um, is trying to see how we fit into the larger market of liberal arts colleges. They're the ones helping drive our modern, modern market positioning, and they work with institutions across the country. So they're trying to say, you know, where, where do you fit? Additionally, when we brought in consultants from um, ACRO, uh, the Association for American College, I can never remember, mm -hmm. it's registrars and others. Anyway, we had consultants who helped us um, specifically address recruiting and retention. Um, and, and they did, again, a big picture survey. So we aren't entirely driven within. We value that external perspective and trying to figure out how and where we fit. 
Secondly, in terms of regional um, appeal, we are well aware that students, um, I, I talk to people in the region frequently about whether or not we offer anything of interest to students who are interested in agriculture careers and things like that. And we are tackling that head on. The Morris Challenge is one piece of tackling that so that we're getting high school students to campus so that they can see that we have this. Another is our partnership with the Center for Renewable Energy Storage Technologies with the West Central Research and Outreach Center that will make it, again, a partnership focused on things that are relevant to the communities around us. We also are um, amplifying our environmental study, our environmental science field, and uh, hiring through the um, generous donor funds uh, an endowed position in environmental science. We're doing a search for this year, so we're really uh, paying attention to um, right now. If you the, the farmers with whom I talk will say you don't need an ag de degree. Right now, what you need is an economics degree or a management degree or an environmental science degree or a biology degree. You need those things. Our local audience doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily keeping up with that. And that's part of our outcomes to show that, for instance, we have a recent grad who works as a dairy researcher to show that we have um, you know, people who go into all sorts of careers in the environment related to agriculture. One who's um, an alum who's a lawyer for one of the massive dairies near town, for instance. So there are lots of places where we draw that line. We just haven't been as clear about it in the past as we need to be. And that's what I'm aiming to do is really show that I need to convince the local population that this is a place for them as well. On the whole, our students um, at Morris Area High School, they don't necessarily go to college at all. And so that is another one of the challenges. It's yes, some of them do go to uh, NDSU and UND, um, but they also go to the Twin Cities. They also go other places. Um, so it's a mixed bag, but one that we are aware of, and I think we are trying out some things to see if we can do better on um, making that argument where we are. Thank you. Uh, Regent for Halen. Thank you, Chair Johnson um, and Chancellor Sean Erickson. Thank you for all this information. But where you started with us was how might we better advance the visibility of the University of Minnesota Morris? And one of the things that really stood out to me in your presentation was the discussion of the three-year program and the statistics of how many students are entering college with college credits. Mm -hmm. And what comes to my mind is the challenges student, students face in evaluating their different colleges and seeing how the credits they may be bringing with them fit into that college's program and that university's program and anything that can be done to make that easier for them, whether it's online tools, whether it's part of the application mm -hmm. process so they can actually see how those credits translate into their credits at that university and where it puts them in their program as far as advancement, as far as moving ahead in mm -hmm a semester or moving ahead in a sequence, um, and then where they may even be able to augment that before they enroll, you know, where they can see, all right, I have these, but if I add this one, it will actually put me a whole year ahead. Mm -hmm. Anything that can be done to automate that process more where they're not left wondering, I'm applying, I have 20 credits from a PSEO program, from a college in the schools program, but I'm not from an AP program, but I'm not sure how those will actually translate into my true credit load at the university until I fully apply, until I fully get accepted, until someone fully, anything that can be done to streamline that, I think is um, beneficial not only to the prospective student body, but also incredibly helpful to parents or legal guardians or supporters of these students as they look to college and helping them see what the next two to three to five to six years might look like for them. Vice Chair Johnson, Regent Verhalen, I, I completely agree with you. I think that we've looked at a lot of the tools that other institutions around the U.S. have for that kind of information. We do not have um, really a good enough layout of that. I just um, was shared yesterday um, um, on a file showing the three-year templates. So how does it look? What are the requirements for these three-year templates? And I hope that in our website rebuild that we have a much clearer way to communicate to students with transferology, which is you know, students can put in and see 
which credits transfer and then meld that with the three-year degree pathway so that it would be clear for every single one of our 34 majors. Um, but I, I agree with you completely. It needs to be clear. Thank you. Uh, student Representative Davis. Yes, thank you. I'd also like to strongly echo Regent Verhalen's comments about that. As a student myself, the fact that most of my AP credits transferred into the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus was a huge factor in my decision. Um, I came from out of state. So it was a big deal to me that I could get everything I needed like over and it gave me the opportunity to double major. And so that was a huge decision maker for me as a student. And the fact that I could see that when I was applying made, was a huge, again, a very large factor in me deciding to come here. So I think as a student, it's so important to be able to see that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Davis. Is there any other questions or comments? Well, okay. Thank you all for a Thank great you. presentation. Next on our agenda, we will hear from Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education, Scott Lanyon. Provost Croson, would you like to introduce this item, please? Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Johnson and members of the committee. Uh, the university's success as a land-grant R1 AAU institution is closely tied to the strength of our graduate education. Collectively and individually, graduate students are integral to our teaching, research, and outreach missions. Today, we're joined by Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education, Scott Lanyon, who will provide an update on this important topic. Thank you, Provost Croson, <coughs> Vice Chair Johnson, and members of the committee. So, really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about graduate education, something that I'm reasonably passionate about. Uh, many of the impact measures uh, that we have are really focused on undergraduate students, not surprisingly, four-year, six-year graduation rates, things like that. <clears throat> but some are explicitly about graduate education or designed to cover both undergraduate and graduate students. And today, I'll be talking about three of those impact measures related to grad ed. But in order to put that into context, I think it's important to review sort of how we structure post-baccalaureate education here at the University of Minnesota. So we subdivide our post-baccalaureate population into graduate students and professional students. The first group of degrees on the left side involves traditional graduate education where a major portion of the degree program involves research or creating new knowledge. Students who are pursuing professional degrees on the right side there are most often seeking um, or pursuing professional degrees that lead to applied professional or practice-based employment in the fields uh, that are named in their degrees. The degrees generally lead to licensure. Now, the line between these two is somewhat artificial and a little fuzzy. Um, it's really an administrative division that we make, and it's unlike many other institutions. Uh, we've divided uh, this, this population in this way. So that I, as uh, Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education, I oversee the graduate degrees the professional degrees are primarily overseen by the, the various colleges, okay? And I should also say, when I'm talking about graduate education, I'm talking about it for the system, okay? Not just the Twin Cities campus. Just to make things more complicated, a lot of our professional students would actually call themselves graduate students, right? So it can be very confusing, and it's one of the reasons why it's important to revisit this periodically. Both graduate and professional education are highly valuable and defining features of the University of Minnesota. They're essential to the university's impact on the state and the nation, um, as well as the university <coughs> standing as a world-class institution. So on this slide, you see the distribution of students, as well as the degree programs, the degrees that we offer at the university. It's also, I think, important to note, we talk a lot about undergraduate education, undergraduate students, not surprisingly, but. A little over a quarter of the students in the University of Minnesota system are actually post-baccalaureate students, graduate and professional. 
So to elaborate a little further on the division between graduate and professional, graduate education programs, um, yes, they involve research, creative activity, original scholarship, but in addition, they typically require a dissertation or a thesis that comprises that student's original scholarship or research, and it requires a thesis examination committee. On the professional side, the professional programs generally involve explicit codes of professional ethics or principles that are established by the particular industry or profession, covering the matters that are pertinent to practice in that field. It also involves quality or performance standards that are typically enforced by a professional association or accreditation body, again, very different than graduate programs. And typically they require a professional, a professional licensure or passage of some examination in order for the student to be able to practice. <coughs> so for the remainder of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on these graduate students and graduate programs, the research masters, PhD students. Um, again, the professional programs primarily overseen by collegiate deans. So the first of these impact measures uh, is uh, under our commitment to discovery, innovation, and impact, and, and specifically this goal of research growth. And the action that was identified was increasing the percentage of graduate students and postdocs employed in positions that use their degree. A slight aside here, I haven't mentioned postdocs. <laughs> postdocs are people who are in training, they've already gotten their PhD, they've not yet pursued their permanent employment. They're still in a intermediate sort of training function. We have around 800 postdocs at the University of Minnesota system. And our goal here is to maintain um, a satisfaction of basically of 95% of them indicating that they are using the training that they received here at the university. So what are we doing as an institution? Well, a lot of this is happening at the colleges uh, necessarily. Colleges will do things like uh, incorporate professional development uh, in the curriculum, might provide some internship opportunities, encourage um, scholars to uh, really explore uh, various employment sectors and have mentors from those sectors. And specifically, colleges are doing a lot more these days at finding uh, their alumni and having those alumni serve as mentors for, for current students. But the difficulty is with graduate programs is that our students end up pursuing a very, very wide range of career paths. So it's very difficult for colleges to incorporate all the different kinds of professional development that might be needed for that broad diversity uh, within a curriculum. So that's where the graduate school comes in and, and other units, frankly, at the university. Um, we are helping students to think uh, more broadly about their careers. Critical because in graduate education, graduate education is actually pretty stressful. There's a lot of stress on these students to be creative, original thinkers, think outside the box. And unfortunately, what that often leads to is for students to think about the degree as, as the goal and sort of lose sight of the longer term perspective when the degree really is a stepping stone. It's a means to an end. Uh, it's a necessary step to pursue their dream career or job. So the graduate school tries to focus on helping students really keep sight Think about that longer term. A variety of things we do, there are many, but I've just picked out a few here. Trying to encourage students to have individual development plans or IDPs. This is an opportunity for students to, on a regular basis, do some self-reflection on the careers that they're interested in and to test themselves against those careers about where their strengths and weaknesses and to start thinking about ways to add additional skills to shore up some of those weaknesses that might not come from their curriculum itself. The graduate school um, provides um, professional development workshops. We do a variety of online tools to help graduate students uh, sort of expand their, their skill set. And recently, we've begun to also start tracking our PhD and postdoc alumni. Part of that is to better educate our current students as well as prospective students about what you can do with the degree, right? And to help them actually serve as mentors for students. That also helps us then take the step to actually come up with a metric for this particular impact measure because we're now surveying those alumni. So in our most recent survey, 98% of the respondents indicate that they're using their Minnesota, University of Minnesota training significantly or moderately in their current job, all right? 
Our goal was to maintain that at a 95% level or higher. Thought you might be also interested, I include this graphic here that might surprise you to learn that over a quarter of our PhD and postdoc alumni have chosen to stay in the state of Minnesota to pursue their careers. Commitment for community and belonging. This is about conducting a climate survey and specifically looking to increase the percentage of students who have a favorable sense of belonging. And again, this is a metric that uh, applies to all of our uh, students. I will talk specifically about graduate students, of course. We do a variety of things. We certainly work with our graduate programs to encourage them to implement best practices. We're um, in touch with other higher ed institutions, our uh, AAU institutions, and are learning from them as well uh, about how to be as welcoming as possible and supportive of uh, graduate students as they are here in their graduate careers. A key piece that we are focused on now and for the next few years is really preparing faculty to be as effective as possible as advisors, to be supportive, especially of students who come from a diverse background. Many of our students are first generation. The concept of a graduate education is kind of new to them and really requires some, some thought as to how to advise and mentor them. And we are administering and have been administering a survey, Grad Seru, which is comprehensive and includes questions about climate, uh, which we do every other year. We will be doing it again next spring. And the outcomes uh, I can report uh, are that we have seen an increase in sort of satisfaction with program climate from the, mo the most two recent administrations of the survey. The percentage of graduate students report that there are graduate climate is positive and welcoming. If we're looking at research master's students, that increased from 90 to 94 uh, percent with research masters, and for PhD students, from 85 to 88 percent. Next, still in this space of community and belonging, our goal to recruit and retain diverse students, faculty, and staff, uh, the action is to increase the percentage of BIPOC or underrepresented incoming students as well as graduating students uh, year over year. And again, I will be talking about graduate students. In 2020, we piloted a system-wide diversity conference and a recruiting fair. Uh, we are now, we uh, took a year off, um, but we are now starting it up again this year, this November, and we'll do it annually. This is a virtual event where we invite undergraduate students who identify as coming from an underrepresented population, whether they're freshman through senior, all of our undergraduates across the system. And the idea is to introduce them to what a graduate education is and what they might do with a graduate degree so that they can make an informed decision about whether this might be of value to them. Again, we have many first generation students in our system who the idea of a graduate degree is pretty foreign. Uh, and so we are looking to really educate them about this. And in addition, this event gives them the opportunity to meet with representatives from our various graduate programs that they might be interested in to learn more about what a graduate degree in X would be like, what the experience would be like. We do consultations with graduate programs to help them um, improve their welcomeness, their support of uh, students from all backgrounds. Um, and this is something we do on a regular basis. Um, part of that is, again, communicating best practices. One other thing I wanted, effort that we've made that I wanted to call out is this pilot that we did for a number of years called Creating Inclusive Cohorts. What we did was partner with graduate programs that identified as a priority that they were really trying to increase the diversity of students in the program. We partnered with them to allow them to provide them with resources to offer recruiting fellowships, uh, one-year recruiting fellowships, to a, at least six students with the whole that they would matriculate at least three of those in a single year to a single program. The idea being that that would sort of jumpstart diversity in that program. That would be better for those students. They would have a cohort of students from underrepresented um, uh, populations. But it would also help those programs to increase their success in recruiting in subsequent years 
as long as those students were in the program. We've actually examined the first uh, year of that, and in fact, all of our programs that participated in that experienced increases in applications from students from underrepresented populations. They made more offers to such students, and they actually matriculated more students than was true of, of programs that did not participate in this program. So we're very uh, excited that this may be a, uh, the kind of intervention that could be really helpful in moving us forward on our diversity initiatives. In terms of outcomes, you see here um, trends since 2018 in the percent of graduate students who enrolled here who identify as BIPOC, increasing from 14.5% in 2018 to 17.5% in 2021. In the next part of this presentation, Provost Croson and I thought that it would be helpful for you to um, talk, for us to talk to you about some of the issues that you're probably going to hear about, uh, probably heard about this past year and likely to hear about in the coming year. And a big part of this in graduate education is about um, the competitive landscape. We are competing with other top institutions for the very best students. Um, the majority of our graduate students actually choose the University of Minnesota because of the faculty that we have. They've come to work with individual faculty or a group of faculty, and that is the attraction. That's the draw. That gets us into the mix of places to, whom, to which they apply. But sometimes the decision ultimately is made on the basis of resources and what kind of compensation we can provide. Each semester, over two-thirds of our graduate students are either on fellowships or employed as graduate assistants. For the latter, this could be in the classroom as teaching assistants, helping us with our undergraduate mission, as a research assistants, helping us with our research mission, um, and, or as administrative assistants, for example, in the graduate school, working in administrative offices. Now, in addition to providing students with a salary to help them with their living expenses and to be able to afford their graduate education, these assistantships themselves are educational experiences, really important educational experiences. And in addition to this work, typically a graduate assistant is on a uh, what we call a half-time appointment, a 20-hour per week appointment of assigned work. But of course, they're expected to put in significant additional hours on their own scholarly advance, uh, uh, advances in, in activities, research, teaching, and so on, and, and uh, uh, courses that they're taking. As an added benefit of employment, the institution covers their tuition and 95% of the cost of their health care coverage. Now, what we do in this space as an institution is that the institution centrally specifies a minimum hourly uh, salary for graduate assistants, but it's important to realize that really is the minimum. Most of our colleges are compensating at a significantly higher rate than that, but that's a local decision, and therefore compensation for graduate assistants can vary pretty substantially across colleges within the university. This past year, this minimum hourly salary, the salary floor was increased by 3.85%. And the institutional share, institutional share of dependent health care coverage was increased from 65 to 75%. Now, even in the context of this progress, we're still concerned about our ability to recruit, retain the very best students. So we are looking to benchmark um, our compensation and our fees uh, relative to um, our peers in the Big Ten, our public institutions. Um, and that's something that we'll be working on this year. I'd like to also mention just some of the priorities for graduate education for the graduate school. Um, I mentioned the system-wide recruiting conference affair. Creating pathways for all of our Minnesota campuses is really important. We have graduate students at Duluth, Twin Cities, and Rochester. All of those programs are looking especially to diversify, and we've just heard Morris is a great place to be recruiting students. And as well as Crookston, as well as Rochester, Duluth, all of our campuses, um, we could do a better job recruiting our own graduate students, our own undergraduate students into our graduate programs. Um, and 
I'm pretty confident that our success in recruiting our top students is greater here than if we're recruiting in Southern California. So we really, this is something we need to elaborate on. And that leads to this point. A high priority of the graduate school is increasing the diversity of students receiving graduate degrees. Uh, and that ma maintain, that is a constant for us. Uh, this recruiting fair is a big piece of that. Our consultations is a big piece of that. But we have many activities in this space. So a lot of talk about standardized tests in higher ed these days. Um, we promote holistic admissions uh, in graduate education, uh, which means we encourage programs to make appropriate use of the GRE, the graduate record examination. Um, the decision on whether to use that is actually a local decision. Each program makes their own decision. At this point in time, less than 25% of our graduate programs require the graduate record exam, just so you know. Improving graduate student mental health. Big topic, links with many of the things I've already discussed. Graduate education is stressful, but there are aspects of a graduate education that are probably unnecessarily stressful, and those are the things we really want to focus on, try to remove some of those things that are adding stress unnecessarily, um, when we know that being the first person to invent something or to create something is pretty stressful. <laughs> That's kind of what we ask our students to do. Providing professional career development, key, we talked about that. That's one of the, the goals in, in really helping our graduates to be successful in the careers, the careers that they want. Uh, that will continue to be a focus. And lastly, and these, are these last two are clearly coupled, figuring out ways to be increasingly responsive to employer needs with our graduate programs, our graduate curricula. So just in summary, just a reminder, graduate students, they may not be the most numerous population of students at the university. They are really important population. They support our teaching, our research missions. Increasing the diversity of our graduate students actually leads significantly to greater innovation and productivity for the university and for the state of Minnesota. We are, with these programs, creating the next generation of intellectual leaders. And I'm not talking about just faculty leaders, but leaders in all industries. The question I'd leave you with is, how do you see the employment opportunities for graduate students changing in the next five to 10 years? How might we, as an institution, adjust our programs to accommodate that? Thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Vice Provost Leinen, for your presentation. Colleagues, uh, let's turn to discussion. Um, Regent Hipsch. Yeah. Looks like I'm going first again. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, uh, Vice Provost Lanyon, for your presentation. I learned a lot about uh, graduate schools and professional schools. I think the one thing that saved your presentation was you had the word pathways in your second to the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm really going to concentrate on with my remarks. I think, I think it's really important that, uh, that we create these preferential pathways for our, our own campuses mm -hmm. so people can start off where they feel comfortable and then they can still get into schools uh, of their choice. And I think we do a really good job of filtering our students and, and accepting the right students at our, our undergraduate campuses. And so it should be a pretty easy road to get into graduate school. And so um, that's what I really like to see us do more of. So if a, student starts off at Morris or Crookston or Duluth or something, they got a preferential pathway. And so I'm not saying to uh, water down the, mm -hmm. the, the, the student or whatever, the, the right. candidates. I'm saying let's go after the better candidates because we have a preferential pathway in the under, undergraduate system, and so we've pre-filtered that already. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's going to really boost our enrollment because as a parent, you're saying, where, 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 where's my child going to have the most success? And you're coaching them through that. And if, if they know they want to be a professor or they want to do research or whatever, and they can start off at Morris or Crookston, I think they're, the parents are going to say, yeah, that's a good pathway to get there. It's a preferential pathway, actually. And so I really encourage that. I think it's going to be important to, for our out-of-state campuses. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Any, any response? Thank you, Regent Hipsch. This, I 
agree completely. Um, I think that it is something that we haven't focused on as much as a system, and it's why we've wanted to do this recruiting conference and fair to help our programs to actually uh, capitalize on the fact that we have great undergraduate students throughout the system. Okay. Yes, Regent Hibbs, follow up. Um, to, to the previous uh, discussion, I think that's how we get to the 1700 in five years, or by the year 2025, <laughs> by doing that. And I really believe we can get there. Um, but we're going to have to have that, that block M prevalent in everything we do. Mm -hmm. And so it's got to be a system-wide approach. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Rishi Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is one of those rare moments. I agree with my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, and we have some three plus one programs popping up, especially considering that three-year graduation rate isn't that crazy anyway. That's becoming standard for some people. Um, I missed a lab of its MBA by that much. They introduced the three plus one right as I was finishing up. So I think that's a great idea. Um, I have a, um, a brief technical question and then um, another one as well. I know specifically the Duluth campus, there are some PhD programs there, but they're granted through the Twin Cities campus and, and I know housing in there would change some classification. I know I'm misspeaking, but I, I remember there was some interest in granting those um, from that campus. I, I don't know if that's still a conversation being had. That's the brief technical one. And then my other question, um, one thing I know we've spoken about before and whenever I've had the opportunity to, to speak with graduate students, something that comes up is that uh, faculty advisor relationship um, how, how it, you know, it's integral and, and, and really important to their education and experience, um, which is great when it's going well, but how bad it can be when it's not going well. Um, so, and obviously that's just an ongoing conversation, um, but just wanted to, you know, get your thoughts on, on, I know we've spoken before about a lot of the initiatives and, and things being done around that, but wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to that as well. Thank you very much for the question, Regent Kenyanya. Yes, um, two things. So just to clarify, we have PhD programs that are officially administrated by the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, but the students, PhD students, are actually located at University of Minnesota Duluth. We have several of those programs. Um, and that is something that um, is, I think, there's a state issue associated with that that would have to be changed if that were to be changed. Um, we, as a graduate school, oversee all of them, regardless of what campus it is. Um, and those programs, I will say, are working really well. There, there are some really great PhD students at Duluth, um, which really supports the research mission of the faculty at, that, uh, at the institution. So yes, so there are PhD students there. Technically, they're part of the Twin Cities campus um, uh, in terms of admi administrative reporting. Your point about the relationship between graduate student and advisor, this is a really important point for people to understand. Uh, graduate students are heavily dependent on their advisor for um, uh, advice on taking on the, uh, picking a research project, whether it's a master's or PhD. Um, sometimes it's for support. It's introductions, professional networking. Um, it's actually letters of recommendation for a decade or more after they graduate. It's a really, really strong relationship. And when it goes well, which it does most of the time, it's great. Something like 85% of our graduate students report that they would be very happy to uh, recommend their advisor to other students and, and so on. There are a, few, a smaller number of situations where it's not working well, therefore, the provost put together a task force this past year. It was actually a, something that the Council of Graduate Students had requested. Um, a task force on uh, this issue of faculty behavior interactions with graduate students. That uh, task force issued a report and we're looking at that, um, at implementing those recommendations. And I will tell you, as I talk to my colleagues nationally, they're really excited that the University of Minnesota is doing this so that they can all learn from us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, yeah. Dean Langan. Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, that's really important, and thanks for that. I'll just make a comment myself in here. I think one of the, I 
product of a professional school. And one of the things I think that's really different between graduate school and, and professional school is exactly that. Because mm -hmm. if you're in medical school or some other, you know, I, as I just become interested in a particular area, I could seek out people who could be mentors in this department or that. But if that doesn't work out, there's, you know, 10 or 100 more other people you mm -hmm. can, you know, it's not dependent on one person. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that, that really uh, is a very different experience, I think. So I really applaud what's going on because I know when we first came on the board, I think we had some meetings with students and this, uh, there were some concerns expressed about when advisors mm -hmm. weren't going well with the graduate students. So um, this is really important. I don't know if you want to say another word of, on that or. I mean, it, it, graduate education is uh, very much an apprenticeship kind of model still. And, and that relationship is really pivotal. Um, I think the fact that <coughs> Excuse me. The fact that we um, that we do have so many graduate students who are happy with their advisor is a is a great thing, but that doesn't diminish the fact that there are some that are challenged. Um, Dean Landon reports to me that you know when we look at the uh, people who come to the Office of Student Conflict or other kinds of places describing the challenges that they're having, ninety percent of them are about communication and kind of a misunderstanding or a miscommunication or a lack of communication. And so that's what we've been really focusing on. Uh, it just making sure that instructor, that uh, you know, advisors and students communicate with each other about expectations and goals and what are reasonable turnaround times and what are co-authorship arrangements and all of the kinds of things that uh, graduate students and advisors need to work out. Great, well thank you both for your work on that. Are there other? Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair Johnson, um, and, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I got a question and then um, I guess a couple questions. Uh, the first is, do we know, um, and, and, and again, maybe I missed it, but do we know the percentage of uh, University of Minnesota baccalaureate graduates who go on to graduate or professional school? And, and, and how does that, I mean, maybe this question for Provost Croson, uh, how, and, and how do we compare to other similar institutions for people matriculating into uh, graduate professional students? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I believe that we do from our, from the undergraduate placement surveys, um, but I don't know that number off okay. the top of my head. We'd have to look at it. The, Madam Chair, Chair it, it, I'd, I'd be very interested in that because, you know, from a, um, a personal standpoint, as an undergraduate, I, I had a, you know, one of the great things about what was on the College of Ag, now CFANS, is it was a smaller college, and the department head was my advisor, and we, and we would have lunch every quarter. It was the quarter system, and we would talk about school, but, but one thing that I remember it was as I was entering my junior year, I had mentioned um, the possibility of going on to graduate um, school, and it caught, it, it caught him off guard a bit, and, I, and it made me wonder how many other students may have that interest. But it, so i you know, wondering if we have any kind of a routine process or a systematized process for ensuring our undergraduates understand that graduate and professional school are opportunities, but you also need to start preparing for them before your senior year. Uh, otherwise, you've got to do a lot of scrambling to get caught up. I mean, it, 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 and then after that, I have a comment. But do we have a, is there a process for making sure our undergrads at all of our campuses understand that that this is an opportunity and that there's a process to go through. So I would I would lean on Bob McMaster to sort of respond to that who's not here today. But uh, you know I believe this is absolutely something that advisors do um, when there are faculty advisors, faculty advisors, but but professional advisors as well, and career counselors. As you think about kind of what's your next step, they are absolutely thinking about graduate education as well as uh, job placements. Thank you, and Madam Chair, if I can just make one comment, actually building off of your comments. Um, I think that's absolutely right. I had both the opportunity to be a graduate student here as well as a professional student here, um, and they were incredibly different experiences. Um, I, you know, I had an amazing advisor. Um, I was uh, fortunate to have uh, then Dean of the Humphrey Institute, G. Edward Chu, was my advisor, um, and uh, we, you know, we both came out of applied economics or agricultural economics, and so there was a lot, a lot there that made it just an amazing opportunity. You know, I still, to this day, all the years of school to have that experience um, to work with with somebody of of that caliber uh, made it all worth it. But um, so obviously, I feel very good about my advisor, and, and it was a wonderful experience. And then, you know, with professional school, it, it was a little less personal, 
right? It was, and, and I think that um, to the extent that Dr. Johnson, you know, sought out specialists, and I don't know that a lot of students necessarily do that. I think you, you attend your classes, you get your grades, you seek your degree, and you move on. And, I, and, and again, I was fortunate in that role that I had a couple of professors where I was able to take multiple classes from them and, and establish a relationship, but it was different than the advisor status. And so to the extent we can ensure that the professional students have that connection um, I don't know you know if we, we, there's something that that we would ever do different than anybody else, but there is a pretty substantial difference and i and the people that I know that had come through the graduate program, the block M seems to be kind of deeper in their soul where the professional students you know still cheer for their undergraduate school when they play the gophers so that's uh, um, you know there, there's a bit of a difference that way as well, but um, appreciate the presentation and and obviously. The, the graduate and professional programs at the university are so critical to the state, and thank you for the work you do. Thank you for your oh, brief. Huh? Thank you for your comments. Yes, I just, like to respond. I just want to interject because it's yeah. something Regent Rocha brought up. Uh, in terms of encouraging undergraduate students to you know consider graduate school or putting it on their radar, in my experience at least, I think it also just varies by what their undergraduate discipline is. You know, just anecdotally, I remember when we're talking about post college plans. All my science friends, I'm like, well, you guys aren't done with school. You did biology. I mean, you, you know, you, of course you guys come back. But then, you know, um, but then, you know, in the business school, we're thinking more career. So I think the opportunity may be to, to help some of those other disciplines that don't typically think, um, that, you know, graduate school to, to know that there's options. Because there's things I'm finding out now that I, that I just never considered. Um, so just a comment there. Thank you, Regent Kanyanya. Regent Tad Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to um, commend uh, the Dean for uh, such an excellent job he does on making contact with each of the graduate programs. I had the honor of being a, a DGS, a Director of Graduate Studies at UMD for a number of years. And I know that Provost Croson and uh, Dean Lanyon are working closely to try to solve the problem of uh, graduate students at the Duluth campus uh, wanting to take graduate courses at the Twin Cities and vice versa. There are, in my program, for example, several uh, people wanted to take uh, graduate programs in our program, but what they found was they were getting double bills uh, from the it was a one stop at UMD that would build them and a one stop at the Minneapolis campus that would build that, uh, that would also build them and it would take them half a semester. So another bit of stress to, uh, uh, to and I, I know we're working on trying to unify that and, and trying to eliminate that problem. And um, I, rather than simply changing the name to two stop, um, <laughs> I'm just curious how you're, how we're coming on that. <clears throat> uh, Regent Johnson, uh, Regent, sorry, Chair Johnson, Regent uh, Johnson also. Um, yes, yeah, so indeed our, our registrars are working together and our financial aid units are working together to think about how to avoid the double building problem. It has to do with the fact that the systems that each campus has are uh, have kind of generated from those campuses and have not necessarily been as connected as they could be, but it is absolutely something that is a high priority for us as we continue to enhance our systemness and also as we launch uh, distributed education uh, models that um, draw from courses throughout our campuses, right, John, the expertise of multiple campuses. It's something that we're, we're going to need to resolve for that as well, so... It is absolutely on the radar. Any follow-up question? Regent Johnson? No. Regent Johnson. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Provost. Colleagues, are there and any I'm other good. questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your presence, uh, Vice Pro Provost Lanyon, and your presentation and the information we shared. Questions? At this time, colleagues, we will take a no, no. Oh, ten minute break, and let's see what time. And we'll reconvene at eleven ten, or is that eleven fifteen? <coughs> yeah, eleven fifteen.
Regents, the meeting, the meeting will now come to order. Please. <laughs> Item three on today's agenda is review of proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy, commercialization of intellectual property rights. This is just for review and discussion today. We'll take action at a further meeting in the future. To walk us through the proposed amendments, we're joined by Vice President for Research, Shashank Priya, welcome, and Rick Hipsch, Executive Director of Technology and, and Technology Commercialization. President Gable, would you like to make opening statements? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Johnson and members of the committee. So today you're gonna to hear an update on this Board of Regents policy, commercialization of intellectual property rights, and suggested revisions to the policy uh, that are focused on readability, that make clearer the university's ownership of research data and patented inventions, and increases in support for university startups. All of this aligns with MPAC 2025 commitments two and three related to discovery, innovation, and impact, and to mentor sections, respectively. And we're very proud of what has already happened in this space. I'll note we've had record startups and patents over the last year, and we're on an upward trajectory that keeps us very much on pace to meet our MPAC 2025 goals. So I'd like to add my welcome, uh, Vice Chair Johnson, to our new Vice President for Research, Dr. Shashank Priya. We will do, ironically, his formal introduction in a few minutes after <laughs> this presentation, just based on the order of the agenda. But this is his first presentation to the Board of Regents. Mm -hmm. And as you say, he's joined by Rick Hipsch, who is Executive Director for Technology Commercialization within the Office of the Vice President for Research. So at this time, I would turn it over to them. Please. Yeah. Good, good, good morning, Vice Chair Johnson. Um, so we'll be presenting the policy related to the commercialization of IP rights. Um, this topic actually aligns very closely with one of our three missions of the university, which is research and discovery. Um, and we are conducting very high quality research, scholarship and artistic activity that benefits our society, state and nation and the world. And, and an important part of this research and discovery is creating the transitional pathway for the knowledge that is created by our students, scholars, and the community. And this aspect is very much driven on this, uh, by this policy that we are going to present. So I will introduce my colleague, Rick Hipsch, Executive Director, Technology Commercialization Team. His team is very responsible for all facets of technology transfer, and he's going to describe the reviews that we are going to present to you. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, Johnson. So uh, I wanted to provide uh, maybe th three to five minutes of just background and then we can talk about the actual policy changes. Um, as has been noted, uh, we have a technology commercialization office and, and our mission here at the university is to uh, facilitate the transfer of these technologies into the marketplace, into the world. And uh, we, we want these, these technologies developed into new products and services. Um, we hopefully uh, can satisfy many parts of, a, of the mission of the university in benefiting the public good, uh, building economic growth, and <clears throat> excuse me, generating some value for the university's mission. Uh, while we know it's not all about money, it is part of our, our mission and it does drive in, in, in many cases the acceptance of the university's technology, the university's research technology. Uh, the delegations of authority that we have um, include filing intellectual property, uh, doing the licensing of intellectual property, doing the startup companies, uh, and, and uh, handling the revenue that comes in from those uh, transactions. Uh, we manage approximately uh, uh, 1100, pa over 1,100 patents. We have thousands of technology cases. We have over uh, almost 3,000 licenses that we manage, and we've done over 200 startups. So it's a, it's a very busy operation, which gives credence to the research that's done at this university. And we are a system-wide service, so we do service all of the, the campuses. 
Um, just as background, uh, this is the primary policy, but there are elements of the copyright policy, the Board of Regents copyright policy, which we're not reviewing today, but there are elements within that that are referred to by this policy, and uh, we do respect the copyright policy at the university as, as part of what we do. And there's also a university internal administrative policy uh, on reporting inventions and, and <coughs> software arising from research. So these are the policies that govern the work that we do on behalf of the university. <coughs> Uh, just as far as a timeline, this particular policy was adopted in 2007, has been amended a few times in the past few years. Uh, this is a particular, a, a, I guess I would call it a, a um, uh, review that, that happens every three to five years. There's not a specific item in, in this, but we do believe that policies, as, as all board policies, do need review at occasion. Uh, the previous policy was really a collection of other policies or the, the policy that was adopted in 2007. But the important parts are that it's the university's responsibility, our responsibility for the university to assert the university's ownership of the intellectual property that's developed by the faculty staff as part of the research. Uh, we want to affirm that students own their own IP. We're not uh, claiming that IP that they develop in courses and that as part of the administration, we're charged to commercialize this university held intellectual property and, and supporting the, the startups. Um, if, if some of you are familiar, uh, um, the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980 uh, really established that federal research, that the uh, intellectual property rights for the federal research would uh, be held within the research institutions such as the University of Minnesota, so that we are really carrying out uh, what was uh, governed by the, by the, the federal Bayh-Dole Act in 1980. Uh, as part of our process, we did uh, consult with and work with the Office of General Counsel and with the Board of Regents Office to follow the uh, correct procedures. And we really looked at this as an opportunity to, to clean up the policy and, and to make some, some minor changes. Uh, we worked through all of the faculty committees and, and worked with the research associate deans, the faculty senate research committee, faculty consultative committee, and the faculty senate. And each of these bodies had a chance to review the policy and, and uh, each of these consulted uh, bodies did endorse the changes that we're uh, recommending. And so finally, just to kind of walk through, uh, these are supposed to be bullets one, two, three, and four, but anyway, they're all number one in priority. Um, the, uh, the first one is to um, improve the readability. Uh, and, and in many cases, when we were benchmarking, every university that has a technology transfer commercialization office has a board policy. Uh, we benchmark many of those along with our colleagues in the general counsel's office. And uh, we have actually reduced the number of words and, and uh, while it remains about uh, four to five pages, it's, it's actually a very condensed and uh, I believe uh, well easy to read a policy in comparison to our, our peers. Um, but that was a lot of the changes. So if, you, if we were to produce a change bar version of this, a red line version of the document, you would see a lot of red, but the actual content is fairly um, minimal, the content of the changes. Uh, the second is to add uh, a definition for research data. Research data is, comes in lots of different forms, and we're particularly trying to define what portion of that research data is affiliated with patent adventures that we commercialize. Uh, thirdly, um, we have a program at the university called Discovery Capital, which has been in place since 2015, uh, where the university can uh, it invest some uh, additional monies in university startups, and there was a cap put in place uh, many years ago at 1.05 million, and we would like that cap raised to 1.5 million, as suggested. And then the final thing is there were words and, and language in the policy about our startup companies, about owning and holding controlling equity in these, in these companies. It's not something we do. It's not something that's really commercial, commercially makes any sense. There were a bunch of restrictions that were never implemented because our policy is never to own 50 or 51% of a, a company. So we uh, struck those uh, superfluous uh, text from the policy. And so kind of in summary, those are the, the, the changes. Um, and at this point, um, as uh, was stated earlier, this is a review. Um, we're not uh, uh, asking for a vote or anything of that nature today, but we wanted to uh, take questions on the revisions that have been made. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any other, other questions? Regent Mayron? Yes, thank you. I just have, as I'm trying to understand this, uh, the changes to the policy or uh, the revising of it, 
So these are kind of technical questions. The first has to do with that slide that's right before the questions or feedback. Um, the, the third number one. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, how did you decide or how did the recommendation come to go from 1.05 million to 1.5 million? What was, wh why that number 1.5? Why not more? Why not less? In other words, what was the thinking behind that particular number? And then I have a second question about to understand um, student inventions or roles with students, but I'll ask that one afterwards. Okay, Vice Chair Johnson, uh, Regent Mayron. Um, the, the designation of the Discovery Capital Program in that 1.05 million and 1.5 million, uh, part of that is generated based on how the program is implemented. The program can make up to three investments in a company very early stage and then some follow on investments and the policy previous, excuse me, the procedure that we, we utilize uh, puts up to 350 million, 350 K in three investments. And that's how we got to that 1.05 million. So we'd like each of those 350 K investments to be allowed to be 500 K investments. So that's the, the simple math. Um, the reason, you know, in terms of, of what companies are raising, uh, this policy was put in place in 2014, I believe. Um, the, the amounts of money that companies need to raise has, has uh, um, been driven up just based on time, right? The companies need more money to raise, but also um, the fact is the, the matching, the way the program works is we do not make the entire investments when we're investing in university companies. We require a match and the matches are also going up. And so the companies are requesting more money for the University of Minnesota. We feel that it's very nominal, the amount of money that we're changing from 350K times three to 500K times three. And it's really, it's not a significant change, but we found it limiting in what our companies are looking to raise. And we just feel over a course of time, it's a small change. Um, we're not asking the uh, university to give us permission to invest a million dollars three times, but uh, a small change from 350K to 500, and then those three investments. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Um, second question. Um, under the, uh, let's see, it's on, on our materials that was page 50 of 71. Um, this has to do going into the policy ownership of student created technology. So I'm trying to understand how this works. The language says the university doesn't claim ownership of technology developed or research data generated or acquired by a student in connection with their participation in a university course or educational activity. I, I understand that. And, but then in subdivision C it says, except that, well, it's basically saying notwithstanding the foregoing, uh, the university does own the invention if the student used substantial university resources to develop the technology. So how do, what does that practically mean if it being in a course and, and a student invents something in the part of the coursework, it, the student can own the invention, but, um, but if apparently there are additional resources beyond the course, I, I'm, I don't know how you'll know it when you see it. Uh, Vice Chair Johnson, uh, Regent Mayron, the um, first part of that sub D2 talks about does not claim ownership for um, student developed technology in connection with the participation in a university course or educational activity if they would be part of a research project a federally sponsored research project. And during that project, they were involved uh, and required you know, substantial university resources, whether it was, was uh, machinery labs, um, materials that were provided as part of that research project. That's where it would cross that threshold of substantial university resources. Um, if you are you know, in a discipline as an undergrad student, for example, and you're in a course where you're using lots of university materials, but it is basically a result of your tuition that you paid at the University of Minnesota to take that course and to get that those substantial materials. That that wouldn't trigger this clause. It's only, you know, as associated with with research activities. Thank you. Hey, okay. well, thank you, uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Johnson. Regent Mayron actually touched on exactly what I was going to ask about. Um, and I, 
maybe looking at the provost here, because I know we think of coursework in the exact opposite way, um, you know, where students don't fully own coursework, and we, we've had discussions about, um, you know, the websites and services, you know, where people share such material. Um, how do we delineate those? Um, could, I, could someone claim that coursework is intellectual property? Um, you know, how, how do we think about these two things differently? Yeah, Chair Johnson, Regent Kenyanya, thanks for the question. So indeed, the uh, curriculum and the course materials are the property of the faculty member, right? They develop the slides and the lecture notes and those types of things. And when we're talking about academic dishonesty and sharing sites, we're talking about those materials. My understanding of this policy, and I'll yield to Mr. Hips if I'm not correct, is that this is about the product that the student produces in the course. So if the course has a final paper or if the course has a final project where the student generates that information, not where the faculty member is generating that, then that is the intellectual property that will belong to the student. Chair Johnson. So, okay, because I thought papers weren't allowed to be shared as well, or is that just a test where the, the instructors created it, but it was my understanding that papers were also treated that way. But yeah, I, I don't know exactly where the final paper stands on that. Um, yeah. In that place, I'd have to talk to somebody who's more of an expert in intellectual okay. property law than me. Thank you, Judge. I was just curious. Thank you. All right. Student Rep Davis. Thank you. I had a uh, thank you, Re Regent Johnson. Um, I had a quick question. Due to some of the recent scan research scandals at the university, and I'm thinking particularly of like the Linux scandal in 2021, how does that affect the students who are attempting to commercialize their intellectual property with the university label? Um, and then if you, uh, and then I have a follow up as well, depending on your answer to that. Okay, Regent Johnson, uh, uh, excuse me, Vice Chair Johnson, Regent Davis. Um, I, I think the commercial impact, if you will, of, of any of these types of scandals, it's really you know, a, a difficult thing to measure. Um, we do have uh, students in, in this particular example in computer science that are working with professors and we have uh, research professors that we work with that we are able to commercialize. Uh, it's interesting in the example that you picked, the Linux community in general doesn't commercialize much at all. So I don't know that there'd be any commercial impact of that particular example, but in, in other examples, let's just generalize. Uh, yeah, I think there's, there's always a reputational uh, concern and um, as we, on behalf of the university, approach companies or as we might start companies to commercialize that research, that reputational um, impact uh, you know, it, it affects our ability to commercialize. So you could argue that if you're a student that are working on something and the research program that they're within suffers some kind of reputational impact, you could argue that that would maybe uh, limit their commercial uh, viability. But I think in the particular Linux example, it really wasn't a, a, a commercializational opportunity in, in any case. Yes, um, and then my, my one follow-up is, yeah, I was interested in hearing if there were any amendments to the policy that were gonna uh, address that, those sorts of questions, or if there's anything in specific that covers the purview of my question. Um, uh, Vice Chair Johnson, Regent Davis, I, I don't believe that it's, it doesn't, uh, at least in, in my opinion, it doesn't strike me that uh, it's a policy decision, it might be a value decision, um, I, I'm not sure uh, we can address reputational risk and, and uh, the concerns. We have a concern, all of us do, as part of the university for those types of, of, of scandals and other things that might damage the reputation of university research. But I'm not sure that there would be a policy revision that would, would make sense. We can certainly c uh, contact the Office of General Counsel to get their advice on that, though. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Director Hirsch and uh, Vice President Priya. Thank you, Regent Johnson. Thank you. Yep. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the presentation. I'm kind of carrying the spirit of Regent uh, Randy Simonson. This was one of his big uh, areas of interest in, in understanding this. And you know, I, I'll follow down that, that road, because I, I don't think there's a huge change like under Section 8, you know, the division, uh, uh, income uh, division. But, you know, kind of from a public perception, a lot of people are always concerned about whether the university is protecting the public's interest in its university when it comes to this. Um, you know, always there's always the 
the folklore about the faculty member who just decides I've had enough of academia and goes off uh, uh, and lo and behold starts a company with a new technology very similar to what uh, they had worked on while they were um, at the university. And, 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 and so I, you know, when, when we talk about that portion of this, of the commercialization, I think there's some improvements here, uh, but on the, on the underlying part of it, um, if, if someone were to say, uh, you know, how does the university protect its interest compared to say, I mean, we're, we're within a 20 mile radius of a whole bunch of companies that do a lot of research and a lot of, a lot of uh, great success in, in uh, coming up with products and inventions and, and intellectual property. Um, say compared to a 3M, mm -hmm. um, how, how does their investment in the research and creation of, of intellectual property and their capacity to capture a return from it, how does it compare to what we have in front of us in this policy? Uh, Vice Chair Johnson, uh, Regent Rosha, um, I believe that the, the policy itself, um, as you noted, has not changed in terms of, of compensation and kind of if you look at it from an ROI perspective, um, we view all the monies coming back as an ROI, whether those get distributed to uh, inventors, departments, colleges, or to the university. Um, in terms of the number of inventions or the amount of inventiveness that happens at the research university, um, it's a little bit difficult to compare to the 3Ms. I, I would put 3M at the high end just simply because uh, 3M is driven uh, obviously by their intellectual property, but uh, compared to other universities, oftentimes it's, it's looked at as a percentage or a, a ratio of the research expenditures. And so if you compare, for example, the amount of inventions that the university receives based on you know, every uh, million dollars of, of research expenditures, um, we compare very well with other Big Ten universities. Uh, we'd have to, you know, compare against the, the privates, or excuse me, the public universities, and I think we, we compare favorably. But beyond just getting the number of inventions, it's really important to look at how many of those are we actually protecting, whether they're uh, patents, trademarks, or copyrights, but pr predominantly patents. We, we spend approximately $5 million a year on patents. Um, and, and that's, they're in all stages. I mean, patents are expensive, but we spend about uh, $5 million in expenses. Uh, we aren't on the high end. Um, we certainly aren't in the low end, um, but that's one measure, but it's not just what, how many of them that you patent, because you can patent anything and you can accumulate lots and lots of patents. What are we doing in terms of commercialization? So there are other ratios that we're looking at, again, compared to universities, not to the private sector, to other universities on how many of our technologies that we're patenting, are we actually transferring? And we're, we're well known, and what we compare very well on the number of licenses we do, um, but there's always room for improvement. I would say, the final thing I would say is that there's been a progression, if you look at the stats of, of what the university has done and what our office has done, it's been a, a very uh, steep progression in improving the numbers, whether it's the number of licenses, uh, revenue and such, but the revenue is really a very lagging indicator. And so we believe we've um, planted lots of seeds uh, with lots of the licenses that we've done. Um, it's not going to be the, uh, um, the, the $500 million a year revenue uh, for the university that, that some people might imagine because we have all these patents, um, but I think we're in a, a very strong case on revenue compared to other universities, not compared to the 3Ms, and that you know, we, we, we intend the, the number to continue to grow based on seeds we planted 10 years ago, five year, years ago, and a year ago. So um, it's, it's not definitive. I can't point to a single metric, and I certainly can't compare to 3M, but you know, I think we're doing a good job. In, in the national rankings, we do extremely well. Yes. Thanks, Chair Johnson. Uh, you know, Director Hipsch, thank you. I, so just leaving us lumped together with all of the other public research universities, would public higher education, public research universities, are there things from the private companies that do maximize that revenue? Are there things that we as institutions ought to be looking at to move into that direction? Or in, in short, are we easy pickings you know, for other people to benefit from investments that the university through public dollars and other dollars make in, in, in research, or do you think that it, we're maxed out in our capacity to, to protect those interests and maximize the, the revenue that would obviously give us lots of opportunities, lower tuition, more investment in research, et cetera? 
Uh, Vice Chair Johnson, Regent Rocha, yes, I think that's, a, that's actually an excellent question and, and you reminded me of, of Regent Simonson who I talked to a few times and one of the things that we would actually like to see to help, help grow the, the value, if you will, um, prior to licensing or prior to doing startup companies is to invest more in those ideas kind of if from the inception stage, which is mainly basic research that's sponsored by federal or state or other, to, um, to actually invest some, some university money from some sources that can advance some of the key technologies so that there's more value prior to licensing. And then that, as Regent Simonson would say, will allow the university to get a higher return on investment. So I think there's some work to do there. We've got some ideas and um, Vice President uh, uh, Priya has already, uh, we've already had some discussions about those ideas in his first few uh, few days on the job. So I think there's some ideas there. The other thing that we are seeing a strong emphasis on is um, corporate research, uh, corporate sponsored research, and, and much of our corporate engagement, which can also, whether you call it easy pickings or not, it's we want to have good relationships with the 3Ms, the Medtronics, and many others, so that when they're sponsoring research, there's a contractual relationship that both sides benefit. And it's a tighter relationship, um, you know, rather than just throwing about a bunch of patents out there and hoping they license them. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Executive Director Hipsch and uh, Vice President Priya. We're we're happy that you were here. It's uh, glad to meet you for the first time, and look forward to further interactions with you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Johnson. Thank you, thank you Regents. <laughs> this brings us to the consent report. Pro Provost Croson, will you please provide a brief overview of the items in the consent report? Thank you, Vice Chair Johnson. I'm happy to present the consent report for your consideration. It includes program changes and one tenure case. It has my and the President's recommendation for approval, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Oh, any questions? Is there a motion to recommend approval of the consent report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed signify by saying no. The motion is approved. And finally, the information items, Provost Croson. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Johnson. In addition to our regular report of select student, faculty, and staff accomplishments, we have an update on a policy review and a Carlson School program in China. As the docket notes, the medical industry track within the MBA was originally approved by the Regents, and at the time, Tanji University's School of Economic and Management was the named partner. Uh, Tanji has since canceled all degree partnerships with universities in the US and the UK due to new Chinese regulatory requirements for joint degree programs. The subplan itself isn't changing, but we did want to inform you of the change in the organization we partnered with to deliver the degree in China. The Carlson School will continue to oversee all aspects of the curriculum and instruction for this sub, uh, subplan option. On the policy review, Associate Vice Provost uh, Stacy Tidball, Interim Director of the Office of Student Finance, Nate Peterson, and the Student Finance Leadership Team all reviewed the student financial aid policy and did not recommend that it be opened for review. Chair Johnson, this concludes our remarks. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions or comments on the informational items? Okay. Seeing none, that concludes our committee business. Before we adjourn, please note the Finance and Operations Committee will be meeting here at 12.45, so 12.45 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>